I'm Dr. Rick Green from the 1970 medical school class at the University of Virginia and it's my great pleasure to be the host of this series of interviews that's recognizing many of our wonderful emeritus professors and excellent faculty at the University of Virginia and today it's extremely pleasurable to me to talk to Dr. Ken Greer. Uh, we go back quite a way and uh, Ken, thank you so much for being with us. Look forward to it. We appreciate it. Let me, let me ask you, first of all, um, you're a Virginian. Yes. You've been here for many years. What kept you here? Why, why the university? You could have gone anywhere you wanted. I looked to go to Duke one time and University of Texas in Houston one time and just for a fleeting moment, but my whole uh, life has been here now and uh, never really thought about going away. I, I think the whole ambience of the university has kept me here. It's not just the medical center, but the school itself, an outstanding institution. I'm involved with attending sporting events. Uh, I went to medical school here, as you said, have, after having gone to Washington Lee undergrad, but it's, it's the whole picture, and the reason I stayed in academics has to do with many, many factors, but I, I really never seriously looked at going to another institution. My first wife, who's still my friend and, and patient, felt maybe we should switch to another city. She's from Chapel Hill, and so an opportunity went, uh, became available at Duke University. And I looked down there, and then I did have an opportunity to be head in, in Texas way back when, and now nothing compared with here. So you gravitated toward dermatology. Um, obviously, there was a spark lit there somewhere, uh, and um, maybe you could tell us about your mentors in Durham? Yeah, the, the spark happened in the United States Navy, actually. I uh, had done internal medicine residency at the University of Rochester and signed up to do a cardiology fellowship under a wonderful man, Paul Yu. And I joined the Navy. They sent me to the Indian Ocean, and on my destroyer, and two destroyers, everybody had rashes and nobody had a heart attack. So there were young men, and I didn't know a thing about it. I had not rotated through dermatology. I had lectures at UVA, which we had at that time. They no longer really lecture. But I called Ed Cawley, who was the, my chair, and just to come up to Charlottesville to talk about dermatology, I said, I just don't know enough about it. And he checked my record, and I'd been a halfway decent student, and, and he offered me a residency position, but I had to let him know in 72 hours. I came up to talk about dermatology. Driving back to Norfolk, just talking with that individual turned me on. And that's important, even in my medical school career here, there were individuals who just stood out as outstanding. Bill Parsons of medicine, uh, Slaughter Fitzhugh at ENT. I call them the great white doctors because they had white hair. So it was the, just talk with them and the opportunity to go up and learn from a master, as Ed Cawley was, was uh, I just turned the corner, but all my internal medicine friends thought I had fallen off the bridge. But incorrect, so I stayed with it for 40-some years now. Well, you, you, you've got a perspective. How, how has the, the, the whole area of dermatology, especially of dermatology, changed over these uh, three, four, almost five decades? My career personally has changed some because I had done internal medicine first, and so I was basically a medical dermatologist and received a lot of consults from around the state, which was always exciting and challenging. But as I have become older, my patients have become older and they have developed more and more cancer. So a lot of my practice now is, is excisional uh, dermatology. I don't do any cosmetics. I'm not against people who want to spend that kind of money for a cosmetic procedure. I point out on my wall as a calendar of a Harley Davidson motorcycle. I spent. I, I said I spent eighteen thousand four hundred sixty-two dollars on that motorcycle. And if you want to spend that on on cosmetic stuff, go to it. But it, just, it won't be coming from me. So I stayed with medical and surgical dermatology and the patient care and the fact that I've been able to work with residents all these years is what's made me hang in there as long as I have. One of my great pleasures. Um was to work with you and start a program calling, called Day at the Medical Center. And uh, we would bring wonderful young 
undergraduates and college students. What's happened to that program and uh, are you still involved? No, I'm not involved with it. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get involved with the Medical Alumni Association and subsequently Foundation and in the medical school for, for the teaching aspect of it very early in my career and that's one of the, the advantages I have had with certain projects I have been involved with is to work with fantastic people and, and going back I just look at a picture of Bill Booth as I walk down the hallway he really helped me out because my professor Ed Cawley was retiring and I wanted to do something that was most important I thought at the center at that time it was the creation of a chair so I went over to talk to Bill Booth and realized that I didn't know anything about fundraising and but Ed Cawley had a lot of people that were were uh, very impressed by him and, and so we raised the money and we created the first chair and that was working through the Alumni Association. The Alumni Association does the white coat ceremony and things but I've stayed on the board over here many many years as, and contributed hopefully in a positive way but then I've spun off into other things but that that was fun what we did and interacting with those young folks and I do lecture every year and have for a, a program that started out for minorities and Richard Lindsay runs this program and they bring in undergraduates who may not have a, a real major or easy foot in the door it started out as a minority situation African Americans predominantly and now it's opened up so something has, has taken over in a way for that day in the life of the medical center that you and I were involved with. You were much more involved than I was. You've seen students come and go. How do you think the medical student has changed today? Now, when we talk about work hour uh, issues, work hour constraints, are there positives, are there negatives that you've seen in, in generally in, in students who go into medicine today? My exposure is overwhelmingly limited to dermatology now because they changed the curriculum entirely and I no longer give my annual lecture, which I love to do and a lot of people remember. They didn't remember I taught them anything about dermatology, but I'd always show pictures of ducks and geese and deer and animals that I do tend to shoot and they mixed in and they always remembered that. But now they've changed it, but they don't. But the, the female numbers have quintuple. We had one lady in my medical school class, Vivian Penn, a very close friend of mine, and uh, now, you know, it's well about 50 percent. So uh, I'm exposed to them in dermatology. It's one of the more sought-after specialties, and they're always top-flight students. So we get a lot of top-flight applicants, but I don't have the, the exposure to the regular uh, medical students now because they can't rotate through. There, there's, you know, so many of them that we can't accommodate them. I would like to have more contact, but we just don't have time. But they're sharp as devil, as we always say. I don't think I would have gotten in med school. <laughs> That's probably true. Reflecting <laughs> back on being a chair of a major academic department, what what's changed over the decades uh, that you've been involved in, uh, and especially the time that you've been chair? What's what's changed in in in, in being an academic chair? Well, the 15 years I was chair. A major transition occurred is when the hospital became provider-based clinic and took over much of the operation. So the autonomy, which is never great compared to private practice, and that's one of the drawbacks one could consider staying in academics. You lose your autonomy. Uh, but it, the provider-based clinics has changed, changed the whole scene uh, dramatically. Some for the good, some for the bad. But I don't have, I did not have the control over the department that I would have liked to have had uh, for maybe five or seven of the 15 years that I, I ran it. But the, uh, you know, the, the triangle of the, the medical center, the hospital, and, and the uh, clinics, it, it alters things significantly. So I had plenty of power as chair, more than I wanted, more meetings than I wanted. But I would have probably liked to be in more control of hiring individuals that I would I would have wanted to have hired. You're as busy as ever, I think, in doing many things still around the medical center. But what are you doing outside of medicine that you really enjoy? Well, at 74, I uh, still ride my motorcycle. I, I hope you wear a helmet. I absolutely wear a helmet. Uh, picked up scuba diving in 1999, and have done some major trips to the South Pacific. I'm the oldest one on the dive boat, 
now, and so I realize I don't have uh, a lot more time to do it. And I uh, bought a place down on near the Chesapeake Bay, and I bought a little boat, and I run my boat up and down the river. But I still work here. I'm still 40-hour work week, but it's down from a much larger number when I was chair. Well, I want to congratulate you for what you've done for the university, obviously in medicine, but also what you've done for the Alumni Association and, and being an outstanding alumnus, and you've been recognized for that, so I want to thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I'm very proud to be a part of this organization for a long time. It's been our great pleasure to have Dr. Ken Greer with us today as part of this uh, video interview process. Kenny, thank you so much. Thank you, Rick.